On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Daniel Hood. He is the Director of Engineering at the Action Network. And we're going to be talking about an interesting wrinkle to the topic. So the topic is about adding process without sacrificing agility. And the wrinkle is, is the Action Network's just recently gone through an acquisition. And we're going to get Daniel's thoughts on the entire topic, but also how some of that agility and process balance gets affected as you go through an acquisition. I'm excited to have Daniel on the podcast. Thanks for being on. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. Excited to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, sharing your time with us. I guess uh, two things just to set context, uh, making sure everyone kind of is a little familiar with you and the Action Network. So can you tell us what the Action Network does and what are some of your responsibilities there? Sure. So the Action Network is a uh, sports media company, and we focus on delivering data, news, analytics, stuff like that to fans and sports bettors alike. So you can go to actionnetwork.com and see a little bit about what we uh, have to offer. But my role in the company is I'm the director of engineering. So I head up the engineering department and largely my day-to-day is helping out with hiring. You know, hiring is a big focus right now. As you mentioned, we're trying to grow rapidly. But other than that, I do a lot of mentoring, helping our uh, engineering managers with planning and developing processes. And if it's a good day, I get to do some uh, architecture discussions and more technical things like that. Awesome. And I guess uh, in the scope of you know, the teams you manage, how are the teams structured? Maybe give us a little bit of context in terms of you know, how that's set up. Sure. So when a new engineer joins the team, we put them with their hiring manager, obviously. And the way that we have split the team up is it's by platform. So we have a backend team, you know, a web team, a mobile team, DevOps, et cetera. And engineers are placed on these teams according to basically their technical focus. And, you know, these teams are kind of like your standard engineering teams at uh, other companies. It's where they talk to their coworkers. They, you know, work on problems together. They talk about things affecting their platform as a whole. It's a pretty standard setup in that regard. But where I think we're a little different is that when uh, these teams work with our product managers and designers and stuff to actually get work done, we split up into what we call pods. And these pods are focused around basically key metrics or key features that they're trying to build or drive on a quarterly basis. And these pods are much smaller. They're usually just a couple of developers working directly with a product manager or a designer, whoever needs to be in that pod. And the idea is they're a little bit more agile, a little bit more nimble and flexible and can kind of focus and make decisions at a very low level without having to you know, talk to this entire platform team and stuff. Another big part of it is they have everyone they need you know, to get work done in those pods. So we basically use this to try and reduce the number of blockers, uh, try to keep teams able to build consistently without, you know, having to file tickets for the entire backend team or whatever. How big is the team currently? So right now the team is uh, just north of 20 engineers, uh, and we're hoping to grow that to north of 30 by the end of the year. So a big increase year over year. And I guess, um, you know, we're talking about how do you manage those processes that the team's running by and then you know, not sacrificing, you know, being agile, being nimble. So I guess when you're starting to forward think, you know, bringing in 10 more engineers, are you going to anticipate having to you know, add any more process to that? Or do you feel pretty comfortable with the process in, in place and it's going to you know, you'll handle you know, the additional uh, engineering uh, capacity? So I think we're at a pretty good place. I mean, I'm sure we'll have to add some processes and policies here and there. You know, typically like to, you know, err on the side of fewer processes and keeping people flexible and not having to to worry about things. But that's one of those tools you reach for when the complexity of managing larger groups of people starts to creep up on you and you start to develop those kind of natural inefficiencies where, you know, you're trying to add too many nodes to the graph, so to speak, and getting everyone on the same page can take a little bit too long. So those processes really, you know, help to manage the team as it sort of scales in size. But, you know, we typically try and get feedback from the lowest level, try and, you know, discuss any changes and stuff with engineers in the pods, with the engineering managers that they're going to impact. So we really like to make a point to get our process development pipeline, I guess you could call it, being something that's contributed by every level. So everyone contributes to that process development. Awesome. And I know, um, you know, I guess the wrinkle to the Action Network has been you guys were acquired. Obviously, uh, sometimes you know, things do change for some people. 
other times nothing really changes. How has your world changed in terms of you know, being the director of engineering? As Are you pretty much staying the course? Do you have additional overheads to your time? Well, for me, it's pretty much staying the course. We were acquired by a company called Better Collective, and they've been great. They acquired us for the purpose of basically doing what we have been doing, and that's putting out a great product for users that they find value in, you know, that they want to subscribe to and keep using for years to come. So they've wanted to help us, you know, keep doing our process and just scale it out to reach more people. So we haven't really had any changes day to day or anything like that. They've definitely offered us tons of resources and advice where we need it that we've uh, used to a great extent. But in terms of day-to-day stuff, they've mostly been hands-off. But what they have done is it's allowed us, obviously, to ask for whatever resources we need. And the biggest change for me has been, you know, now we have all these open job requirements and we're just trying to ramp that hiring pipeline up as fast as we can. That's awesome. Obviously, that's the best of uh, all worlds when you get the resources you need and uh, you're basically free to execute at the roadmap level. I guess when you're kind of looking at that, you know, the roadmap and where the company's going, you obviously were acquired and, you know, they want you to keep status quo, keep executing on the plan. Does your personal roadmap of where the team needs to go, has that changed, I guess, pre-acquisition and post-acquisition? Or are you still pretty much executing a very similar roadmap to what you had maybe, you know, six months before the acquisition? I think it's changed a little bit in terms of some things that were more hypothetical due to, you know, can we get the resources for this or not have been, uh, you know, now we know we're going to get those resources. So the plans have gotten a lot more concrete. We've definitely been more cognizant about, you know, taking a more data-centric view of some of the changes and potential changes that we're going to make. So before, you know, we might not have used analytics to the extent that we needed to when making a decision, especially on the engineering side. And now with the extra resources and stuff like that, the Better Collective has uh, allowed us to use. We can take the time to really dig into some of these changes that we want to make both on the feature side and internally in terms of like processes and policies. And, you know, really kind of dig in to a greater extent than we would have been able to because we've been more constrained in the past. You know, our engineers have, have needed to push to build features and things like that. But now it feels like we have a little bit more, I guess, breathing room and space to kind of feel out some of these potential changes more effectively. Absolutely. Do your personal processes change? I guess, you know, obviously we're talking about the team, but I guess in your own capacity, has your job function and maybe how you report into your manager change at all? Maybe not in reporting. I think my job's gotten busier because now I talk to more stakeholders and things like that. And I think that's true of of any company that's growing. It might have been accelerated a little bit with an acquisition. But, you know, as you get bigger and especially when you're in those kind of middle management layers and dealing with multiple stakeholders that are outside of the engineering department, your policy kind of changes from, at least for me, the biggest change was, and I think this is true of a lot of people going into engineering management, you know, from more technical process to more people stuff. And just kind of doing those muscle movements and getting used to attending multiple meetings with people outside of the engineering department, you know, and maybe even outside of the company now and other companies that are in Better Collective's portfolio sometimes and sort of working on those people relationships has probably been the biggest process change for me. That makes sense. Absolutely. And, you know, I guess what's interesting is I'm kind of listening to, you know, the feedback of, you know, things are moving faster there. You know, you're going to add more people. You're going to be focused on growing more functionality out to the product, maintaining a lot of what you're doing currently. When do you think is going to be the tipping point when you're going to have to clamp down on, you know, formalizing and maybe evolving the process to maybe include a little bit more refinement? Uh, You're going to have more people. You need a little bit more control in place. Is it going to be through process? Is it going to be through more managers? How, How do you anticipate, you know, looking at that? Well. At least at my level, a lot of times I look to the managers to be that canary in a coal mine, kind of, when things aren't running correctly. In the past, and hopefully going forward, we strongly value that kind of people over process mindset. And I, you know, I think that's one of the agile tenets. But really talking to people you know, on a personal level and having that good relationship with not only your reports, but you know, with the rest of the engineering organization so that you know, keeping your ear to the ground so that you know when these sort of inefficiencies develop due to scale issues, you can kind of 
act on them quickly before they become a significant problem. So it's really the people part, I think, I look to first for when we need to add these policies and stuff to help you know, clean up those rough edges that are causing problems. But there are definitely process, you know, metric things. We've, one of the bigger things that I've been harping on recently since over the last few months since the acquisition is very regular metrics reviews and things like that on core systems. And, you know, that's not only to get people used to looking at these core metrics and things like that, but, you know, as our responsibilities grow, not only on the management side, but even at the individual contributor level, you know, as people are adding more features and things become more and more critical because we're getting more and more users, getting those guys and girls used to looking at these dashboards and things we create and understanding the impact that these longer term metrics can have is another big piece of that puzzle. You know, sometimes it's not a people issue or a people inefficiency that managers might notice. Sometimes it's just simple things like, you know, response times creeping up on you month over month and stuff. It's a combination for sure. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what are some of those core metrics? Are the and if you can't share, that's fine. But uh, are there any that uh, you really keep close tabs on? If you could share, yeah, I don't think there's any issue with that. It depends on the platform. For backend, for example, we make heavy use of Node.js on our API server, so we pay attention to you know obvious things that I'm sure a lot of people pay attention to, like error code response rates and things like that on the HTTP side, the Node side. A big one for us is the Node event loop you want to keep that node event loop timing very low. And if your node event loop time is creeping up, and this is the amount of time that each uh, event in your Node.js server is spending on a request, if that starts to creep up, that usually means you're spending a lot of uh, CPU time on something or the other. And if you work in Node land, you know that that's not Node's strong suit. Node is more of an IO-driven, you know, evented architecture. So... That's just an example of the type of metrics we look at. And so we'll look at how that node event loop timing has behaved week over week when we do our regular like backend staff meetings and stuff like that. I do want to add, uh, I think it's important to have some sort of anchor point for those metric reviews. You know, it's not just an alarm or something that goes off on Slack at two o'clock in the morning. It's something that you as a team look at, you know, on a weekly or quarterly or whatever it is basis. So you just sort of get used to checking out that kind of less exciting maybe things that people don't normally pay attention to, but it becomes a forefront in your mind. And so when we're shipping new features, people pay attention to stuff like that. As you're looking at some of these core metrics, how often do you and the team sit down and revisit them and adjust the thresholds that you're kind of identifying? It kind of depends on the metrics, but we do have a sort of a weekly, we call it an engineer sync, but really it's an engineer staff meeting. And each platform kind of just gives a quick update on you know the stuff they've been working on, and they do a quick metric kind of snapshot where they just go to their you know each uh, platform has their different dashboard. They kind of show some key metrics that we like to track, and they'll go to the dashboard and just be like, "Hey, this is kind of how things have changed week over week." So it's pretty simple, and uh, it only takes about a minute. We don't adjust the thresholds too much unless we identify a problem or something that's impacting users or impacting somebody internally. But we definitely make a point to look at them at least weekly. I was going to go back. You mentioned uh, leaning on people of a process, and that, and I, I like that. Obviously, one of the core agile tenants. In your view, what's the like optimal ratio to manager to re, you know direct reports? Like, how do you go about balancing that for you know one of your managers? And what is an optimal? I guess it depends on the team, but just overall, I guess the general uh, viewpoint of that. Yeah, it definitely depends on the team, but. In general, I've liked the idea of, I can't remember where I've heard the term, of uh, two pizza teams, which, you know, two pizzas should be able to feed one engineering team. So that normally translates to about eight people is kind of when we start, you know, anybody with eight or so reports, that's pretty much a full team. Once they get past that, we kind of look to split it up or that's when, you know, that mitosis has to happen and they form two teams. Once you get past eight, I think it becomes pretty difficult for managers to attend to all of their reports in an effective way. The cognitive load just gets too much. And it's very contextual. Uh, we're a fully, not fully, we do have offices, but we're mostly a remote engineering team. So I think it takes a little bit more effort to communicate. You know, the way that people always talk to me about it is it feels more intrusive, right, to ping someone on Slack than it does just to sort of say, hey, or talk to them in the office when they're in the snack room or whatever. 
So we usually try to keep the teams a little bit smaller. Gotcha. I guess being mainly remote, you know, you lose some of the water cooler time. Obviously, everyone, for the most part, the last year and change has lost some of that. And, you know, when we're talking about processes, all of a sudden, you might be doing a little bit more due diligence to find things out than you otherwise would have. Has any of that come into play for you? Or, you know, do you guys have a pretty solid, I know you mentioned one-on-ones, is, is everything get, un, you know, hashed in the one-on-ones? Or are you still kind of uh, having to follow up in different ways to, you know, get the data points you need to understand how the team's working? Yeah, we do one-on-ones. I think you need more than that, though. We were fortunate in that we've been a distributed team for years, even pre-pandemic. I mean, we do have offices in San Francisco and New York and in Madison, Wisconsin. But when the pandemic hit and we moved to fully remote, it wasn't as big of a transition. We were used to doing that in the past. But it's definitely more difficult than just having you know regular one-on-ones. I, I think it takes more of a conscious effort to keep those lines of communication open and stuff. They don't just happen organically, like you mentioned, at the water cooler and stuff. I don't think there's a, a solve necessarily. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of remote work. I'm fully remote myself. But I think it really starts at the manager level and getting people kind of out of their comfort zone and participating in, in those group events like we have classes and stuff like that, optional, obviously, but classes that we offer on, you know, learning how to work on API. We have lightning talks we do where people talk about interesting projects or topics or something like that, and they can share it among others in a small group setting. We have kind of mock outages we call game days that we put on sometimes to get people used to dealing with these production problems that can happen every now and again. So any of these kind of optional learning opportunities I think, help to sort of open those lines of communication because it's very easy, especially in a distributed company, for people to get very siloed. And, you know, they go to their one stand-up every day or every other day, and that's about it. So having those opportunities for people to, you know, interact with others and stuff, and it doesn't even have to be learning stuff. We do a video game night every other week after work one day, and you know, a couple of engineers come to that, and we just play video games together. So any way that you can get people face-to-face, or at least on Zoom, doing something productive, I think is a big win. Actually, I think that's really awesome. I was going to ask you, since you know, you've know you had the experience of being remote for a long time, when you're actually communicating out changes in process or you know something that impacts the team and the way they work, obviously, you, know, you guys have never been in an office uh, for the most part, it sounds like. How have you communicated that? Obviously, I'm assuming it's a WebEx, but it's different to see somebody in person and make sure you know a process is being followed or you know something has been changed versus it's all been remote and you know you've communicated out and now they've got to go do whatever it is you've asked i mean the best way is just to discuss it if it is like a big rolling policy change that affects you know the entire organization typically at that engineer staff meeting i mentioned that's an open meeting that anybody can come to we try to be pretty transparent with that sort of stuff and we usually put it out in a form like that, where we'll, you know, I'll kind of talk over why we're making some sort of process or policy change, and we'll open it up for questions and discussion from the rest of the org. And you know, sometimes we make changes to the policy because of feedback. I mean, that's an important part of it. I think the biggest part of getting people to follow or agree with a policy is letting them have some autonomy in giving feedback and helping craft that policy. So you know, talking to people at every level. I do skip level one-on-ones and stuff like that with the rest of the organization, but also, you know, getting managers to talk to their reports about how they feel about a policy or or how that policy is impacting them and if it's working or not. And I think if you, in general, if you explain the reasoning for a policy and kind of let people contribute to that reasoning and, and, you know, have that voice, they're generally happy to follow it because it, you know, Hopefully you can get to a point where it makes sense to them. No, I like it. I mean, I think uh, it sounds like you definitely have a lot more um, on your plate. It sounds like you guys are really very agile environment for a team that's fully remote and has been for a while. And with the prospects of adding 10 more people, it seems like you guys are really clicking on a lot of cylinders. And um, I think the one thing that's really interesting is you know, the adherence to some of the agile principles and kind of staying true to them and, and using them as what seems to be the the guiding, you know, light out there. Yeah, exactly. 
And at the very least, people seem to enjoy working in that environment. So it's definitely a pro. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. I, I know somebody, uh, if they want to reach out, like, do you have a preferred uh, social media, maybe LinkedIn, Twitter, that you would like somebody to reach out, maybe have a follow-up question, could reach out to you? Sure. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. You could also just email me at daniel.hood at actionnetwork.com. Okay, cool. We'll make sure to include your LinkedIn and uh, so I can email you if you have any follow-ups for Daniel or anything he's talked about on the podcast. I'm sure he'd be excited to talk to you. Otherwise, Daniel, thanks for coming on the podcast and sharing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a great time. Absolutely. That's it for this episode. We'll be back again, different guests, different topic. And uh, I've always asked for two things. One, the podcast has been growing organically. So if you liked uh, the episode, you know, share it with somebody that you think uh, might find it interesting. And then secondly, if there's a topic you want me to cover in the future, hit me up on LinkedIn and uh, share that with me and I'll do my best to find a guest to cover it. Until next time, thanks. 